All right, welcome to A Growing Concern. We're going to do a double header tonight. The first half of the show, we're going to talk with uh, Julie DeGraw with the Food and Water Watch, the local Portland chapter. We're going to talk about the agricultural bill, otherwise known as the food bill or the uh, farm bill, and, uh, and Nestle for 20, 25 minutes. And then we're going to move into uh, talking about the coal, the situation with the Beyond Coal campaign with uh, a woman named Laura Stevens, and she's bringing a guest with her, Carol Ross. So first, we'll just move right into this because we're really time constraints tonight. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. You've been on here a couple times in the past and yep. uh, talking about uh, various issues. But uh, I've seen it called a food bill. And I've seen it called a farm bill. But you say typically the actual congressional name is the agriculture bill. Yeah, they usually end up calling it the ag bill for short, which doesn't exactly sound that interesting or exciting. No, it doesn't. <laughs> food, food bill rings my bell a whole lot more mm -hmm. and farm as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you prefer to call it with the Food and Water Watch is uh, you refer to it as the farm bill. Yeah, we refer to it as the farm bill because, um, you know, there's a lot of messaging out there that, that often um, isn't pro farmer. And, and, you know, when it comes to the farm, bill and we really want to have the backs of family farmers and mid-sized farmers in this country that can be really the backbone of our economy if we have a an, an ag bill if you so so you speak so to speak you know that actually works for farmers it will also in turn work for consumers and people who sure. eat food which last i checked are all of us pretty much i've seen those bumper <laughs> stickers you know if you eat you know, thank your farmer or whatever exactly so, exactly so what exactly is the agriculture bill Right, well, that's a great question. It is a really large piece of legislation um, that is reauthorized every four years that, um, although it often takes longer than that to reauthorize it because- Especially now. Yeah, <laughs> and, we have a fairly incompetent mm -hmm. Congress when it comes to passing anything. Um, but the, in short, it's the bill that really uh, regulates how food is grown in this country, how much of it is grown and where it's growing, who grows it, and how it gets to you um, and how it makes its way to the market. And basically, every step of the way to the point that the food reaches your plate is really pretty well defined by the Farm Bill. So it's, and that's why we want, you know, Americans to be a little bit more educated about it because it affects everyone uh, and we all should have a say uh, in what happens with the Farm Bill. What are some examples of how it delineates how these different steps take place. Well, I think it's really important to look at the history of the Farm Bill. It came into existence um, a lot earlier in our nation because we had all these individual farmers trying to grow food for a nation and, and they didn't know how much of what to grow, you know, and we have a glut of certain things and not enough of other things and, uh, and we really realized you can't leave um, agriculture and also there's there's uh, externalities like uh, weather. You can't control the weather. You never know if it's going to be a drought season, a flood season. Mm -hmm. or there's a dust all storm. of these. <laughs> yeah, right. A dust storm. You just there's all these um, uncontrollable factors, and so we really needed to have regulation that would make it easier for farmers to know how much of what to grow, and when and where. And uh, and and it really the farm bill used to work at creating a food system that had some stability. It helped uh, make up for in, in years when we had um, excess amounts of grains, we had a grain bank, um, mm -hmm. uh, so that in lean years we would have extra food available. Um, and, and and we really, it wasn't until the last couple of decades, last few decades, that um, big agricultural companies like Monsanto and Cargill have really succeeded in lobbying Congress to get farm bills that work for them and that don't work for farmers anymore, and that's really the problem we're facing now. Well, so why, how, what do they do in order to make it work for the bigger companies at, at, to, to the detriment of the smaller farmer? Right, so what's really happened over the last few decades is um, we have an agricultural, agri agricultural, excuse me, agricultural system where farmers have to either go big or go home. Um, if you have, uh, if you look at what it ha our food system a few decades ago, you had hun you had thousands and thousands of farmers, and you had hundreds and hundreds of um, of slaughterhouses uh, in in every state. Um, now you have you know one or two slaughterhouses for um, for several states, and you know we, there's just been this huge consolidation in the food system as big agricultural companies have started to control. Um, access basically so b we have are the middleman right you have um, a really good example it's easier to speak about these issues through example sure um, say you're a, a chicken farmer you're growing chickens um, you uh, 
a lot of, you know, if you're in a part of the country where uh, you're the only person who will purchase your chickens is Tyson, Tyson determines how you raise those chickens. And if you don't meet Tyson's standards of how to raise those chickens, then you have no buyer. They put you out of business. They put you out of business. Exactly. So there's a lot of smaller farmers who are working essentially for Cargill against their will. You know, they, if there's no other purchaser, if there's a monopoly in that region, uh, it's either grow for Cargill and grow the chickens inhumanely and, and horribly or go under, you know, and, and, and even with that system, Cargill can, you know, mm -hmm. Tyson, excuse me, Tyson can demand that they upgrade their systems and, and, and put them into debt that they cannot repay. Um, and, and those farmers have to do it if they want to even just, you know, keep their head above water. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of system we're trying to get rid of. We want to increase competition in the markets. We need to re, um, we actually need to reinstitute laws that we, we, that are, had been on the books for a long time that we just aren't enforcing the, the fairness. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's actually rules against monopolies and we're not enforcing them. So we're trying to get the, um, it, it's a horrible, it's an unfortunately named rule, but it's called the GYPSA rule. Um, and it has to do with the livestock markets. And it says that there has to be competition. Every farmer, grower of, or producer of livestock needs to have access to more than one purchaser. And that is not the system we live in right now. So that's one of the things we want to see included mm -hmm. in the next farm bill is, is increased competition. These are some of the details I was really wanting to get at. You come out of the gate right off the bat with them. Uh, when I think of agriculture, Bill, I think of you know, growing vegetables. I didn't think about the incredibly large uh, animal industry, mm -hmm. which, you know, <laughs> is, is both are poisoning the land to some degree, but the land is being much more poisoned by, by the uh, factory farming. Now, is there any, anything in these, in these agricultural bills to, to help protect communities from the incredible amount of animal waste? Well, and that's the kind of thing. I mean, there there's this uh, very small section. I'm trying to. We actually have a, a slide in here no, that we'll, um, we'll shows get, this. But we there there is. Um, we'll a, get that slide up there. A small percentage of the farm bill goes to conservation programs. You can see it here. It's um, 65. Uh, uh, billions of the do billion dollars in the farm bill goes to conservation, and and in in theory that's supposed to be you know uh, kind of mitigating the the impacts that agriculture has on topsoil loss and and any pollution issues, you know, protecting riparian mm -hmm. areas. But mm -hmm. when you look at the impacts and the expense, uh, if you look at the actual full impacts of uh, of industrial agriculture on the landscape, there's there's no way that 65 you know, billion dollars is going to go anywhere in, in really stopping that. And there's mm -hmm. no enforcement. Um, the, the Egg Bill does not really regulate, like, those huge uh, um, lagoons full of animal waste that are produced mm -hmm. by hog farms. I mean, that's just, and that's exactly, I mean, Food and Water Watch wants to, by up, updating and, and, and improving the farm bill, basically do away with factory farms. You know, you don't get healthy food out of that system. You don't get healthy farmers out of that system. Uh, you, uh, you're you breeding super bacteria and those, you sure. know, it, it's like even if you're not concerned about whether or not it's humane for the animals, although I, I think you should be, even if you're not <laughs> concerned about that, um, there are other reasons to care about factory farming. Well, I, I read in a science magazine a couple, three years ago that next to energy production, the waste that comes from these, from these animal farms are second as far as carbon production, a fo carbon footprint. I could believe that. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have that sad off the top of my head, but I could, I could completely believe that. I um, mean, something else, uh, I mean, w while we're talking about this, the slide that we just had up a few seconds ago, um, I, the, the main reason why I put this slide in there was to make another point, um, which is that uh, a lot of folks who, who care about the Farm Bill or organize on the Farm Bill um, really want to change subsidies. Uh, they, they get really upset that um, some subsidies go to Monsanto and these big agricultural companies. And Food and Water Watch definitely wants to see subsidies revised so that subsidies aren't going to big agricultural companies. But, but family farmers, I mean, it's that subsidy that keeps them from going completely under. It's the subsidy that, that keeps food on the table. Um, so to get rid of subsidies altogether, um, would really destroy the family farmers even further, more so than the big egg, you know, industry right. has already done. And the dinosaurs would survive it. Right, right. And so, and so we really don't want to see that happen. So uh, we're looking for more incremental change um, on subsidies. But what's really important to understand is that as far as subsidies are concerned, if you look at this graph, uh, we'll the vast the majority of the budget in the farm bill goes toward nutritional programs. 
providing food and making food available to uh, to people who have difficulty accessing it. Um, so what Food and Water Watch really focuses on, um, especially for this next round of this next round on the Farm Bill, is we want to make sure that those programs are not um, not cut. We want to make sure that the, the food stamp program, the SNAP program, and all these programs that are providing food to people who have difficulty accessing it are fully supported, and if not, that they get increased funding, because that is where um, the Farm Bill does the most and the best work is in making sure that people have access to food. And mm -hmm. those are exactly the kind of programs that are going to be on the chopping block um, as they try to control you know, the budget issues in Congress. So you say it takes more than four years. Has it been more than four years now, and are we up against the, uh, some sort of deadline to have to get this passed? Well, yeah, you know, it, it, we don't live in a world anymore where this stuff is predictable. Um, mm -hmm. So Food and Water Watch, I mean, technically there should be a 2012 farm bill. The odds of, of Congress putting together a 2012 farm bill and having public hearings on it and going through like the regular process for authorizing a new farm bill and having that actually happen this year seem pretty slim, but we don't control that timeline. But right. technically, this is the year for reauthorization. Well, with the campaign going on, it's, it's, I can see why it would be doubtful. Yeah, and so, and what, and I, I have to put a plug in here for another our other food-related campaign, because because we can't control the timing on the farm bill, um, we do ultimately still want people keeping pressure on their state representatives and, and, uh, and senators, asking them to support a better and a fairer farm bill and make sure that the nutritional programs are protected and all that. But we we realize that if we're, you know, we're a grassroots organization and we need to give people empowering campaigns that they can be engaged on. And we found that uh, what we're fighting here is the consolidation of the food system. We're fighting a system that, I don't know if you want to show this graph, but uh, we talk about the four top retailers' um, share of the market. From 97 to 2009, the top four retailers that are selling us our food um, have taken over over 50% of the market. You know, we we no longer have, um, and even when you go to the store and you have what looks like a lot of different brand names, those brand names are all generally owned by just a handful of companies. We have the illusion of choice right now in this food system. Mm -hmm. So what we're ultimately fighting for here is uh, actual competition and actual choice in, in the market and, and increased access to food. Um, and a big part of making sure that um, people have access to safe, healthy food is fighting genetically engineered food. And we have a little bit more of a control on, on, on the timing of, of, of a campaign trying to keep um, Monsanto's genetically engineered sweet corn out of Walmart and other in all stores. If we can, you know, if mm -hmm. Walmart doesn't carry this genetically engineered sweet corn, then it's likely that other retailers will follow their lead. And it kind of happened, I think, with, with uh, uh, Gerber a while back stopped using something in baby food. And uh, a lot of them just started following suit. It's just, exactly. getting, it's just getting that first big domino to fall. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And the reason why that's a and, and people are like, well, okay, how what does GE have to do genetically engineered food? What does it have to do with um, the consolidation of the food system? It has everything to do with it. Monsanto engineers these seeds, and they can they control um, every step of the process. And when you use genetically engineered sweet corn, it's genetically engineered to withstand. Um, uh, herbicides and pesticides. So you're increasing the poison on the land to raise this food and using a lot of fertilizer, which can ruin water uh, systems mm -hmm. as well. So, um, and you're, it's just ever increasing power that Monsanto would have over our food system and the, the fact that this genetically engineered food is untested um, by, the, by our own government or any independent scientists is really nerve wracking as well. We, mm -hmm. you know, it's completely untested. We have no idea if it's healthy for long-term hum human consumption. So well, for all those reasons, we're, we, we have a big campaign on that as well, and we're ultimately pushing for a genetically engineered food labeling law that would be passed uh, requiring that all genetically engineered foods must be labeled in grocery stores so that consumers can make educated decisions. Mm -hmm. They tried that a few years ago here, and uh, three out of four people were for it until, until the uh, out-of-state money from probably Monsanto and a few other sources <coughs> came in, and they got defeated. Three to one. You know, I, the the iron is hot. There, there have been a few more years of genetically engineered food kind of getting um, out. I mean, it's it's really clear that um, what the dangers are of genetically engineered food, and I, there's a lot more popular. I don't know if popularity is the right word right now, but there's a lot more awareness about um, the dangers of genetically engineered food now than there was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and there's a, a bunch of you know statewide bills that are coming up in California. One just came up in Washington. Um, so we are really trying to build toward a, a federal level 
you know, genetically engineered food labeling law, because if we do manage to pass that, um, the industry knows and everyone knows from polling that consumers uh, will not knowingly choose genetically engineered food. All things being um, equal, they would choose one over the other. Right, and they're not going, you know, exactly, and they're not going to choose um, the, the food that they know hasn't been tested for their own safety. So, mm -hmm. um, and which brings up the point that a lot of this genetic engineer food has not been tested. Yeah, I, and well, none of it's been tested by the FDA or our own people. So it's all been tested by the industry. We're literally trusting Monsanto to tell us what's good for us. You know, I mean, that's that's a little disconcerting. And they got a pretty lousy track record. Yeah, just a, just a little <laughs> bit, a little bit. And there's. Uh, we're about the only country that allows just rampant genetic engineered food to get into the food soup, food supply. I mean, uh, I was going to say China. I don't know about China, but I know Japan, India, England. There's a lot of act, act, activity and uh, action against genetic engineered food. It's only here that it isn't. Well, and the interesting thing, though, is I do want to make this clear that if genetically engineered sweet corn made it into the market, it would be the first produce in your produce section that's genetically engineered. Like when you go to the store, if you're buying unprocessed food, you're not eating genetically engineered food. The only genetically engineered food that you're being exposed to currently in the United States is going to be um, the grain that was fed to the, the cow that you're eating. You know what I mean? A lot of our, our livestock are fed genetically engineered corn and soy, but it's not too, and, and then there's a few like processed foods in, your, in the store that have you know, genetically, genetically engineered soy or genetically engineered corn in them. But in terms of, if you're going and you're buying whole foods at the store, you're not, you're not getting uh, genetically engineered food. And that's what makes us really nervous about this GE sweet corn from Monsanto, is that it would be the first time that you would have a genetically engineered head of corn sitting right next to not genetically engineered head of corn, and you don't know as a consumer which yeah. one is which. And that's what we think is a travesty. You know, you, as, as a consumer, you have a right to know, and that's why we are, are fighting genetically engineered sweet corn specifically because they're planting it. They're planting it as early as this month, um, and and that's uh, they're fast tracking it. And so that's why we're fighting GE sweet corn specifically, as we're trying to keep it from hitting the markets this fall. Mm -hmm. um, and then. Uh, and, and that's part of our bigger campaign of ultimately getting genetically engineered food labeling uh, passed. Right. Well, which is, of course, a long-term goal, but that's what we're aiming at. Well, you got to aim high. Yep. I know locally they've uh, the uh, Northwest Resistance Against Genetic Engineering has been working on the on uh, the Franken trees, as they call them, and the genetic <laughs> genetically engineered grasses that that uh, can uh, can adulterate the local grasses as well. And it's, that's a big industry here. So. Well, moving along here, we can. Uh, you've got a, a graphic up here that what can be done. Exactly. Although it looks like something's cut off. That was uh, the formatting got weird. I think. Um, so, excuse me. Um, but either way, uh, it's pretty easy for you to figure out how to email your senator, and that's what got cut off. Um, we're asking. We're calling on Senator Wyden in Oregon to fight for a fair farm bill to make sure that. I mean, he's on a committee that actually will. Um, be funding the farm bill. So we're asking, that's why we're really targeting uh, Senator Wyden to stand strong on uh, on making the farm bill as strong as possible and making sure that it's funded. Um, Food and Water Watch does a lot of organizing in states where there are senators and representatives on the actual ag committee that, that drafts the farm bill. So we have organizers who are working on that as their primary campaigns in the Midwest primarily. Has there been a farm bill that's been drafted already and submitted in committee or anything? We got really, we dodged a bullet when, um, remember the, the, the Super 9 or the, the, the Super Committee right, that was going yeah. to pass a magical budget that was going to save the universe or whatever? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> they had actually, they had created a farm bill, a really, really ugly farm bill that would have been you know everything we don't want to see in a farm bill and it would have just been lumped into their uh, their decision on how to create a you know how to fix our economic problem since the super committee couldn't come to agreement that just that languished but because we know they tried to do like a secret farm bill like that we're very nervous about what the process will be um, this time around since they're clearly willing to throw you know the common practice out the window are we going to get public hearings are people going to have a say what is the process going to look like is it going to be you know what I mean that, that mm -hmm. we're just very nervous about what Congress is willing to do um, to, to strike a deal well we know you know there there's, there's the old joke senator so-and-so from Monsanto rather than being what Indiana or whatever there's a lot of senators and and, and, and representatives that get a fair amount of money from them, and they might have even come from the company originally well, as well. And so. that's frankly why we have a food bill 
that works for Monsanto. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. that's and we really and we recognize Food and Water Watch has a long term vision. We recognize that we're not going to fix the farm bill in one fell swoop. We're going to keep plugging away at this, and you know, if one farm bill to the next. We're going to just fight for. In this case, it's really fighting to maintain the good programs and get any kind of improvements we can we can aim for. I mean, there's there's a uh, we might actually um, get a ban on genetically engineered salmon in the next farm bill, which would be great. Um, because we've got some really great support from Republicans up in uh, Alaska because they value salmon, mm -hmm. <laughs> wild salmon. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are a few, you know, potential wins we can have in this next farm bill, but we recognize that, you know, this is a decades long, you know, effort. Um, and then the other ways that people can support the campaign are to contact your other, your other legislators, asking them to support a fair farm bill. You can volunteer with Food and Water Watch. We do a lot of work and we're always looking to get more people involved. Um, and of course, you can make a donation to the organization and, and right. join Food and Water Watch to and that, support That's all on your website. But, there, so it's on the website, but that's what the slide is. But uh, um, and yeah, and we've got a lot of information online to, if people want to get more educated on the issue. All right, too. great. So, so, Food and Water Watch. The other half of that is as important as food is. Water is at least as important. Right. But can't have food without water anyway. So uh, we just recently had a decision by an a, a Oregon agency to uh, allow a couple of permits to Nestle to bottle the water that's coming out of the side of a mountain there uh, near Cascade Locks and build a, a uh, bottling, per, uh, bottling factory to make more stuff out of plastic. Mm -hmm. And so we can speak about that for a few minutes here. Mm -hmm. I know we did, there was a recent uh, uh, press conference that, that uh, you, you uh, moderated and folks can go to, to youtube.com slash philosopher seed and that'll be up there and we're going to hear a little bit from one of the speakers from now as we transition into the next uh, segment but uh, well we got a couple you know a few minutes here to talk about this what should people know about what's going on with with uh, Nestle you know Nestle uh, slash Monsanto I mean mm. they, they use the same tactics they really do so we're um there's the complicated way of talking about this issue, and there's the simple way. Well, right now, and we'll I'm going to go over the simple, and it is really, yeah. it is very simple. And we'll do a, we'll do the complicated one in the near future as well. Yeah, there's a lot of background information, but it, but the, the solution is actually incredibly simple. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife um, is the state agency that would be, if this deal goes through, that would be giving away Oregon public water resources so they can be bottled by Nestle. And, in order, and they're, they're applying for a water exchange permit that would allow that to happen. They can pull out of that water exchange at any time. And they're our state agency, they represent Oregonians, and over 20,000, well over 20,000 Oregonians have been calling on Governor Kitzhopper, asking him to tell the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to pull out of that water exchange because it's not in the interest of Oregonians or our public water resources. And it sets a horrible precedent precedent of allowing a state agency to kind of de facto partner with Nestle. They'd be literally giving away water so the town of Cascade Locks can sell the water for fractions of a penny per gallon to, to Nestle so they can bottle it and make 5,000 times profit on it. Mm -hmm. That is a really dangerous precedent to allow a state agency to enter into that kind of a water exchange agreement. So for all those reasons, we're calling on the governor to stop it from moving forward. We've gotten, we've gained the uh, support of over a dozen state legislators calling on Governor Kitzhopper to stop this from moving forward because they're hearing from their constituencies, um, their constituents, excuse me. Um, uh, even Jeff Kogan, the chair of Multnomah County, has sent a letter to the governor asking him to stop this project from moving forward. Uh, and as I mentioned, tens of thousands of Oregonians. You even have the support of a local union, religious groups, uh, physicians for social responsibility. I mean, this is not an environmental issue. This is a, you know, water is a public resource and it should not be up for grabs like this, uh, you know, in our state. And Oregonians have a say. So. Not only that, but they're going to build a, a bottling plant that, that uses plastic made from petroleum. And yep. they're all the, what was it, 200 trucks a day or something? Yeah, it's going to increase peak. the carbon footprint. Yep. And, uh, and, the, and, and what's really great is that the city gives away the, the excuse me, the state gives away the water for free. Um, and then Nestle's 210 truck trips a day during peak season are going to be on the surface roads and Cascade Locks, which are not graded for that level of truck traffic. Guess who's going to foot the bill on upgrading those roads and Cascade Locks? Mm, taxes. <laughs> yeah. And Nestle has made it clear they will not pay for those road upgrades. So the, the state of Oregon will pay a lot of money to let Nestle come into town to bottle 
our state agency's water, like our water, the water that all Oregonians own. Under our Oregon water law, the water is owned by all Oregonians. And, and like we would literally be paying. <laughs> it would be an expense to the state to have Nestle come in and bottle our water. Well, the, the, the folks to, who, on whatever agency that made this decision to get those two permits, they must have been at least superficially aware of these, these reasons. Why would they do it? Um, you may not know. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the Water Resources Department made those decisions, and uh, and and really, ultimately, uh, the line that they will, what they'll say, is that they have to follow very strict parameters when they get these applications, and if there is, if they don't perceive any legal issues with these applications, they have to approve them. They'll just give you the procedural argument. Ah, okay. Um, uh, and that's why we're really saying ODFW, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, is not obligated to go through with the water exchange. They're voluntarily submitting this water exchange application. They can retract it at any time. And that's why the real impetus is on. And we actually know that they're very responsive to the governor because they said way back when Kulongoski was governor that they were moving forward with the water bottling uh, with, with the water exchange because uh, Kulongoski told them to do it. So we know that they're going to be responsive to a, 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 you know, the pressure from the mm -hmm. governor and that's why uh, you know, we're, we're really pushing for this. For this. Um, right. Well the water exchange situation is because they want to use the water that's going to be used for the uh, oxbow fish hatchery, right? Right. So if Nestle just wanted to bottle uh, the town's municipal water, it, would be, it wouldn't be worth their while. Uh, that they can sell the spring water for more money. Um, the Arrowhead brand is Nestle's spring water brand in the Northwest, and it's more expensive than their Nestle Pure Life brand, which is tap water in a bottle. Um, they're bottling municipal water under their Nestle Pure Life brand. Um, if they just wanted to, to open up a Nestle Pure Life water bottling facility, they'd go. They'd probably try to do it in Portland. You know, they would just, you know, bottle municipal water, you know, <laughs> close to the market. Right out of Willamette. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how that's how Pepsi does it, right? Yeah. So what we uh, Nestle is one of the last water profiteers, you know, who's willing to go off the beaten path to bottle spring water and, and sell it for more money. And, the, and they have a track record of going across the country in rural communities that have been hit with difficult economic times, making big promises on jobs and underselling the, you know, the environmental impacts. And, and, uh, and they come into those towns uh, to, to, uh, and, and, and take advantage of their spring water resources. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, in Acosta County, Michigan, and in, in a few cases in Maine, um, and in Atlanta, you know, they've, uh, excuse me, not Atlanta, in, in Acosta County, Michigan, they've had huge impacts to the local water system. Uh, you know, springs went dry, um, and they kept pumping even after that happened. So, I mean, like, this is not a company who cares about rural communities. They're not doing this, mm. you know, right. you know, to, to save a small town. They're doing this to make a lot of money on public spring water resources. Well, it seems like we're running out of time here. We could talk more and more, and we will do so in the future. Maybe we'll do a whole program on this, a whole hour on the Farm Bill and the and the Nestle's. But I want to encourage folks out there to uh, to uh, go to bark-out.org. I know Food and Water Watch is a, a national organization, and you don't have a separate website for here. But Bark, mm -hmm. you can go to bark-out.org, and you can also, on the left side, you can find some uh, newswire items about this particular issue, including the, the, uh, the part of the, vi the video that you're going to see a part of right now. And uh, I want to also mention that uh, Bark has taken its monthly field trips uh, one, one or two times. Julia led one a couple of years ago in January, I believe. And the, the one this week is going to be to the uh, the fish hatchery that we've just been discussing, and you're going to see the water that is going to, that that they're proposing to to basically give away. I mean, they're paying something for it, but it's 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 less than a penny, I think, is what it was. And it's and, and this, it's not to the state. You know, the state's not getting any money for this. Right. So so folks want to go to bark hyphen out or dash out dot org and then read up a little bit on this and come on down to the uh, to the hike this week. I, there's going to be a little change. I think that uh, Portland uh, Occupy. Portland is also setting up a bus and bringing folks up there. So you can get to meet a lot of other folks that are in, 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 uh, involved in this issue and, and uh, you can go onto some of these websites that uh, Julia just just uh, talked about. The program repeats tomorrow night at 8 o'clock on Channel 23 if you want to just go back over some of this information because there was a lot of information here. And the big thing, call Governor Kitsop or send him a letter. Let him know what you think. He needs to know that you know, the majority of Oregonians don't want to see Nestle bottling water in the scenic Columbia River Gorge. It's just not the right place. Not the and right it's not place. the right 
uh, and, and the state agencies have no business giving away public water resources, so it can happen. And so. we don't need to encourage any more use of plastics and, and petroleum along the way as well. It's well, true. Julia, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. We'll do this again in the near future. Sounds good. All right, and so we'll go to a little video of the, the speaker from ASME who spoke at that uh, at the uh, press conference that uh, you moderated a, a week or two ago, and he speaks for about three or four minutes, and we'll come back with a second segment. My name is Jeff Clackey, and I am the treasurer of Oregon AFSCME. Welcome to the Portland office of Oregon AFSCME. For those who are not familiar with AFSCME, we are the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, representing 25,000 public service workers delivering vital services ranging from public safety and corrections to early childhood and special needs education, from environmental protection to care for disabled adults in both the public sector and private sector. As public servants, we understand the importance of protecting what belongs to all of us, including our shared resources, like our state's water supply. I co-authored a resolution that was presented to and approved by the Oregon AFSCME Executive Board in July of 2011, which opposed Nestle's attempt to purchase and control the municipal water supply of Cascade Locks. The resolution was approved to be forwarded to the Oregon AFL-CIO Convention in September of 2011. This resolution refers to a prior resolution passed at the 2009 Oregon AFL-CIO Convention that resolved to, quote, discourage any attempts at water privatization throughout Oregon. It also refers to ORS 537.110 titled Public Ownership of Waters, which declares that all water within the state from all sources of water supply belongs to the public. AFSCME has two main concerns about Nestle's proposal. Our first main concern is the privatization and commoditization of a public municipal water source. We believe this is illegal. We also believe it is immoral and short-sighted. Our second main concern is about Nestle as an employer as well as their portrayal of themselves as being a job creator for the local community. In a study, study published in 1993, Nestle's previous <coughs> project proposals to the communities in which it sought to build bottling plants are compared with actual results, which reveal that at an average, only 24 permanent jobs were created per plant, and of those, only between 10 and 40 percent of local residents actually filled those jobs. Most jobs are typically filled by existing Nestle employees who are transferred. The net job creation for the residents of Cascade Locks, extrapolating from Nestle's history, would only be between two and ten permanent jobs. Furthermore, these jobs have not been at wages that could be considered competitive. Nestle has historically opposed their United States employees' right to form a union and bargain collectively for better compensation. I have learned recently that Nestle is close to entering into a project labor agreement with the Building Trades Council, which would ensure union jobs during the construction phase. I'm speaking for myself, not at an ASME position for this statement here. I personally feel that this was little more than a savvy move by Nestle to divide the labor community over this project and pit union against union. AFSCME continues to oppose the privatization and commoditization of a public water resource and continues to oppose a historically bad employer who has routinely overpromised and underdelivered family wage jobs in the communities in which it builds water bottling plants. For these reasons, AFSCME chose to join the Keep Nestle Out of the Gorge campaign. 